Good day, everyone. Welcome along. A passage between the seas. Now, this is the uh, the story of the Suez Canal. Now, as we're approaching the canal, I thought I'd ask everyone, hands up those people who are doing this transit for the very first time. Oh, wow. Okay. A lot of people. That's great. Well, hopefully this presentation gives you perhaps an insight or even a better appreciation for this incredible piece of infrastructure that we have. Uh, the Suez Canal by numbers. Now, the Suez Canal links, of course, the Mediterranean Sea to where we are right now in the Red Sea. It um, was first started, the work, construction work first started on the 25th of April, 1859. It took 10 and a half years to complete, and the official opening was on November 17 in 1869. So that's 153 and a half years ago. And when I think about that, I think I can't believe that this, this infrastructure that we're about to pass through has been in existence for more than a century and a half. I just think that's, that's incredible. It has a length of 120 miles. Now the maximum ship's beam or the, or the width of a ship that's allowed to go through is 77 and a half metres, but that, that's no problem for us because we're only 29 metres wide. The maximum draft that you can have, and the draft is the distance between the sea level and the bottom of a ship's keel is 20.1 uh, metres, but we're only 6.6, .6, so we're going to pass through quite easily. It's owned by the uh, Suez Canal Authority, which is an Egyptian-based or government organisation or, or authority. And I'll have a look at some of the numbers of the canal. Now, if you wanted to travel from London around down the, the coastline of Africa, around the bottom of South Africa, to Mum all the way through the Indian Ocean to Mumbai, that's a journey of 12,300 nautical miles. If you can bypass that and go through what we now know as the Suez Canal, you are going to save at least 5,100 nautical miles. But what does that mean in terms of time? So the maximum speed of this vessel is 20 knots. If we were going 20 knots, uh, instead of going through the Suez Canal we had to go around, that would be an extra 10 sea days that we would have to transit to get to London. <laughs> now that's an extra 10 lectures for me, it's not going to happen. <laughs> if, uh, if we were doing our, our, our most optimum speed, which is 17.3 knots, which is the speed we came across the Indian Ocean with, that would be an extra 13 sea days. Uh, so that's a lot of time, and we would have to stop along the way at least once for resupply and to refuel as well. But back in the day when this canal first opened, vessels couldn't do 17 knots. You were lucky if you were on a ship that could actually do a maximum speed of seven knots. So this was going to take you more than a month extra to make this journey, to go all the way around there and all the way back. If you had to order something from India, it would arrive two months earlier at least um, because of the Suez Canal. Now let's have a turn and talk of money or fuel. Now this is our ship, the Viking Neptune, we're travelling on at the moment, and this is a very late uh, late model ship, very fuel efficient type vessel, certainly much more efficient, fuel efficient than some of the cargo vessels that have passed us today, some of the large super tankers or huge container vessels, even the, the car carriers, and certainly more fuel efficient than some of the older, bigger cruise ships that we've seen along this journey. But according to the engineering department on board, we use one litre of fuel for every 11.8 metres we travel. Now for those of you who haven't yet adopted the, uh, the metric system, Neanderthals, um, <laughs> To convert that into in gallons, that is 44.6 metres or 148 feet, which is about the length of this built this room that we're in right now. So we use a gallon to, to pass this room. The Viking Neptune is 745 feet long. So we have to use five gallons of fuel just to travel the distance of the ship of its own, own length, which I find quite incredible. So we've used 15 gallons of fuel in the last five minutes since I said g'day to you, which is crazy, isn't it? 
So to make this journey without the Suez Canal, if we had to go all the way around, it would cost an extra 280,000 gallons of fuel. And the fuel that we use is high grade uh, marine fuel. This isn't something where we can pull up at a gas station and put the, the hose in and pump it ourselves. You've all seen these fuel bunker boats that come along the side. They've all got their own fuel that they have to use, their own crews, their own expenses as well. They stay there most of the day pumping fuel into us. So can you imagine the cost of that and how much the Suez Canal saves, not just us, but you, you multiply that by all the ships that are going through, uh, how much fuel this saves the world. It's not the first Suez Canal in history though, because way back in 1897 BC, another canal was made. This was the Canal of the Pharaohs, and it was constructed all the way from the Nile out to the Great Bitter Lakes, and another one from the Great Bitter Lakes down to the Red Sea where we are now. But this could only be used during the Nile flood season but it was very popular at the time. Outside the flood season, it would all silt up and you wouldn't be able to use it. And it was said that Cleopatra and Mark Antony, during their battle, their great war against Caesar Augustus, who's better known as Octavian, uh, when that war wasn't going very well and Cleopatra had to flee from Cairo, she used that uh, canal of the pharaohs to try and, and uh, escape. But it was too silted up, the ship became sunk, she was captured and later had to commit suicide. Then in 1488 when the Portuguese with uh, Bartholomew Diaz and Vasco da Gama discovered that sea route all the way down the bottom of South Africa and across the Indian Ocean to the find out the the incredible riches of India and the Far East and that the Portuguese dominated the Indian Ocean and then after them the Dutch. The, uh, the main people that lost out on that spice trade who lost most of their business were the merchants of Venice and they considered for quite some time building a canal across sewers so that they could circumvent the Portuguese and keep their business operating but they found that this was going to be far too expensive for them. And then in 1804, when Napoleon was made Emperor of France, his army was in Egypt at the time, and he explored the possibility. He had his engineers explore the possibility of creating a canal so his navy could travel into the Indian Ocean and confront the British without having to go all the way around. But his engineers, when they looked at it, said there was a huge difference in the sea levels in the Mediterranean to, uh, to the sea levels in the Red Sea. And that to construct this canal, they would have to have a series of uh, locks along the way, which would be very expensive. So Napoleon decided not to go ahead with this as well. And then in 1846, a study was done which about the possibility of constructing a Suez Canal. This was adopted, this was a French study, and they invited some of the greatest minds in the world at the time, including the two greatest engineers, which was Robert Stevenson, who was a, a British uh, railway engineer, and Al Alois Negrelli, who was a uh, Italian slash uh, Austrian engineer. And they had a look at this and along with their com companions they just they determined that there was really no difference between the sea levels between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea or if there was it was very very minor and that the concept of a Suez Canal was very very possible. The British opposed this. Now the British had the monopoly on the trade from the Red Sea over to India and they didn't want to disrupt that monopoly. So what they did instead is they uh, commission Stevenson to build a railway along basically the present route of the Suez Canal and once again the British were able to use that railway to transport people and, uh, and produce and, and uh, commercial goods across that and once again they dominated that, that trade. They were staunchly against the construction of a canal. And then came along Ferdinand de Lesseps who is the father of the Suez Canal. He uh, was born in Versailles in 1805. His family were all diplomats and he uh, joined the family business. 
He was educated in Paris and at the age of 20 he became the assistant vice counsel in Lisbon. His uncle, Bartholomew de Lesseps, was the charged affairs there and he, um, I don't remember, think, I don't know if you remember, I did a talk about the La Perouse expedition a few months ago. Bartholomew de Lesseps was the only survivor of the, uh, of the La Perouse expedition because he'd left before the, the expedition disappeared. But two years later, young uh, Ferdinand became the assistant vice counsel in Tunis under his father, who was the counsel general in Tunis at that time. And then the appointment that changed history. In 1832, he was made the, assist the vice counsel at Alexandra in Egypt. Now, while he was traveling there, when he arrived in Alexandria, the ship that he was on had to go undergo quarantine for a month before anyone was allowed to go ashore. And Ferdinand de Lesseps was given some books at that time, including a book uh, about Napoleon's plans to build a canal across the Isthmus of Suez. And this became a passion with him, a, a strong interest with him that stayed with him for many, many years after that. He got the ocean that, why can't we do this? He went on, he, while he was in Alexandria, he met the Viceroy of Egypt at that time, a man by the name of Muhammad Ali, and his fourth son, Saeed Pasha. And he became very good friends with young Saeed. Now, Saeed, when he was a, a young boy, was a portly young kid. He was um, a bit big. He visited the buffet more times than he probably should have. His father was dead set against that. He didn't think that it was a good idea, uh, a good look for Egyptian monarchy at that time. So he put young Sayyid on a very strict diet. And it was said that uh, de Lesseps uh, befriended uh, Sayyid by bringing him a secret spaghetti uh, a recipe or a meal, which we now know as macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and that's how he cemented his fr friendship with young Sayyid. Now, Zalesis went on to have an amazing diplomatic career. He served as, as Council General in uh, French embassies all around the world uh, and was well decorated, was honoured all throughout the world. But in 1851, at the very young age at that time of 46, he retired so he could pursue his passion, which was const to construct a canal across the Isthmus of Suez. Now, in 1854, after the assassination of his father, young Saeed Pasha became the Viceroy of Egypt. He served in that capacity for nine years, and he made a lot of money, especially during the American Civil War, because the, the main cash crop of the, the Confederacy was cotton from the South. When the Union fleet blockaded those southern ports, that cotton couldn't be exported to attract uh, uh, money for the South. And so Egyptian cotton became very popular, very necessary all around the world. And young Sayyid Pasha made a lot of money out of that. It was, he was very welcoming to foreigners. He loved foreigners, especially the French. He was a Francophile. He loved their culture, their language, their music, everything to do with the French. And having one of his best friends, as Ferdinand de Lesseps, encouraged that, uh, that uh, relationship. He was very extravagant too. He liked to have parties and he said that his, um, his court was basically modelled on the court of Louis XIV. There was lots of wine, women and parties uh, in his court. He did some good things though. He abolished slavery in the Sudan and Egypt, which he controlled. And he was the person who uh, officially uh, banned sobriety. So anyone could have a, an alcoholic drink in Egypt, even though that was against the teachings of the prophet at that time. And uh, in November 1854, he came across his great friend Ferdinand de Lesseps again. And only a couple of weeks after de Lesseps arrived in Egypt, um, Saeed Pasha signed what is to become known as a concession for de Lesseps to build and, uh, and control a Suez Canal for 99 years. After that 99-year lease was over, the control of the Suez Canal would revert back to the Egyptian government. Now the Suez Canal Company was formed and a commission was set up or a committee was set up which was known as the International Committee Commission for the Piercing of the Isthmus of Suez. Runs off the tongue, doesn't it? And our old friend Alois Negrelli was uh, 
commissioned to write a report about the concept of a, a Suez Canal. Now, Negrelli, as I said, was one of the greatest engineers of his generation, and you've probably seen some of his work in your travels. He, um, this is the Munster Bridge in Zurich, which he constructed in 1838. It's still in operation today. And this is the viaduct, the Negrelli Vi Railway Viaduct in Prague. And if you've been to Prague on a Viking river cruise, you've probably passed under it, because it, that's still in operation today. They just don't make things like they used to, do they? Now, he presented, Negrelli, Negrelli and uh, de Lesseps were able to go to Saeed Pasha and over a three-day period, they were able to present to him the plans for a construction of the Suez Canal. And this was a very detailed plan. It included details of what ports needed to be built, um, what workers were required, what those workers would do, where those workers would need to come from, how many there would have to be, uh, communication along the canal. They'd have to build telegraph stations so they could keep up to date with what was happening in different locations along the canal, what supplies would need to be brought in, where those supplies would need to come from, all those details, ferries that were going to ferry all the supplies into the, the workers in the canal, They'd have to build cities along the, uh, the route of the canal to, to house all the workers and supply them with food and water and everything that they would need, education for their children. Most importantly, where the money was going to come from. How would they fund the, the, um, the construction of a Suez Canal? But they even went into such detail as where the lighthouses would be constructed on the different coastlines and where the shipping buoys, the navigational buoys would need to be so the ships could be guided through into the, the uh, start of the canal. So there was a lot of detail in this plan. In 1856, the final draft of the plan was put forward and the direct connection between the two seas was finally approved by Sayyid Pasha. Port Sayyid was going to be named in his honour, which was going to be the, the new port on the northern entrance, the Mediterranean side of the canal. And the report went to a panel of experts at the French Academy of Sciences and they approved it. They said that all the detail in there were factually correct and they approved the engineering plans and construction could start. Now where was the money going to come from? Now the canal was estimated it was going to cost 200 million French francs, which is about 8,000 uh, British pounds or about 40 million US dollars at that time. Uh, it was going to take six years to build, but as we saw before, it actually took ten and a half years to build, and the actual cost to build it was around about almost double the original estimate, which, you know, for a construction project like this is, is fairly normal, isn't it? The estimated revenues were going to be 30 million francs per year or 5.9 million US dollars per year, the revenue that was going to come in. And all this was going to be funded by selling 400,000 shares at 500 francs or 100 US dollars per share. And that was going to raise the 200 million French francs to fund the canal. Now, when the, uh, the shares were released to the public, none of the shares that were reserved for Britain, Russia, Austria, all the United States were actually purchased. But because uh, no one no one believed in this concept, no one thought it could work. But the French were very, very excited about it. This was their concept, their plan. So they were excited and 23,000 French men and women bought shares in the Suez Canal project and they made up, these French private citizens made up 50% of all the shares that were sold. 44% of the shares were, went to the government of, uh, of Egypt, or uh, Sayed, pa Sayed Pasha, and uh, the other 6% were made up of other Ottoman and Egyptian uh, private citizens. So that made up the 200 million francs. Construction began, and as part of the agreement, four out of every five workers had to be Egyptian workers, and Sayed Pasha had to find those workers. That was his role in the agreement. But there wasn't enough Egyptian labour to do that, enough people who were, were willing to do that. So convi labour, or uh, corvi labour, or slave labour, unpaid slave labour, 
was brought in and used. Now, when the British found out about this, um, they used that as because, as I said before, they didn't want the canal uh, used uh, constructed at all. So, when they found out that slave labour was being used, they um, put publicity out all around the world about we've just uh, gone, we've just um, uh, released all the slaves, we've just ended slavery, and now they're using slavery to build this uh, this unnecessary Suez Canal. But it went ahead anyway. Now, it's, you might think, well, why would these people work on this canal for nothing? Why wouldn't they just leave, walk off into the desert and go back to their homes? There were some guards to guard the Corvée cor labour, but it wasn't really necessary because along the sides of the canal were all the Bedouin tribes. And if you were one of these Corvées who, who left, these slaves that left the canal and tried to get back home, you would more than likely be captured by one of these Bedouin tribes. If you were lucky, they would take you back and they would sell you back to the Suez Canal Company. If you were unlucky, they would rob you and kill you. If you were really unlucky, they would make you one of their slaves and they would work you to death or starve you to death, or work you until you uh, starved to death. So that was, that was the system at the time. And that meant that there was not a lot of en uh, enthusiasm for people to leave the site and go off wandering into the desert. Now, they had to import absolutely everything, every bit of food, every drop of water, uh, all the materials used, all the tools used, every spade, every camel, everything had to be imported. You've all seen the landscape. There's nothing there, nothing at all. So everything had to be brought in. It was a massive undertaking. They had to build towns along the, the, the route so that people could, could uh, live in those towns uh, so they could get out to the, and start building the canal. And most, they had to build a railway along the tracks to bring those supplies in. And eventually they had to build a smaller, narrower canal so they could float those ferries down that were necessary to once again provide provisions and uh, materials for the canal. And this is the way that um, construction first started. It was basically grab a shovel and fill up that, um, that uh, basket and put that on the camel and or the, the, uh, the mule, take it a couple hundred metres away, dump it and come back again. So progress was very labour intensive and very, very slow. This is another photo. This is building the smaller um, canal along the, the way. And it's just manpower with shovels uh, building it. Now after a while, and I'll explain them in a little while, it became necessary to bring in a lot more technology. And these new systems, these new dredges were developed by a German company. And these dredges used to go down and, and uh, pick up all the, the sediment from all the sand and then put it on a conveyor belt which would take it all the way across to the side. And that's the way the canal was eventually dug. Now in 1863, Saeed Pasha passed away and he was um, succeeded by his nephew who was Ishmael Pasha or who became Ishmael the Magnificent. Now he, um, he brought in some reforms including the aboli, uh, abol abolishing uh, Corvée labour which meant that those big machines had to be introduced, new innovations had to be done because there just wasn't enough labour to do this by hand. He also um, brought in his he really supported the canal though and the infrastructure of this canal. He could see that this was going to be a great thing for Egypt. But he got the bug. He loved the idea of more infrastructure. So he borrowed money from all around the world for other infrastructure projects including roads and bridges and buildings. Um, and then he got Egypt into a lot of debt. And eventually that debt was called upon and he had to eventually sell his shares in the Suez Canal, he's 44% stake in the Suez Canal to pay off those debts and he sold them to the British government. Now as I said the British had been against the construction of the Suez Canal but after it was constructed they could see that this was a great thing and um, uh, we, if you can't beat them, join them. And they bought the 44% share for four million pounds, which was a bargain price at the time, and they became the largest shareholder in the Suez Canal. Construction went ahead under the direction of de Lesseps, and nothing was going to stand in his way. It didn't matter what infrastructure problems came along, what political problems came along, what production problems came along. He forged ahead and he jumped every hurdle that he needed, he needed to to get this 
finished. And eventually it was finished and the uh, grand opening took place on November 17, 1869. And the uh, Ishmael the Magnificent spared absolutely no expense in the opening ceremony of this. And as I said the other day, I mean, the world. this was a, a game changer for the world. The whole world was looking at this. This was going to change everything. This is before air travel, so this was going to save a lot of time, money, um, and make it much safer for people to travel around the world. A one wonderful event, and the whole world were looking at this um, with anticipation. And the only thing I can compare it to during my lifetime, as I said, was the Apollo landing, the Apollo 11 moon landings, which happened uh, a century later, a hundred years uh, later. Now, some of the guests that he invited, he invited royalty and dignitaries from all around the world. And the, the two most prestigious guests that he invited were Emperor Franz Joseph and Empress Eugenie. And this is a famous painting of uh, uh, Ishmael the Magnificent. Uh, between, uh, next to him is uh, Emperor Franz Joseph. And taking his arm is Empress Eugenie. And behind them is Ferdinand de Lesseps. There was a lot of talk for a while that Ferdinand de Lesseps and Empress Eugenie were having a passionate affair, but we don't really, uh, we can't really prove this. And this painting seems that they were very friendly, very amicable towards each other at the time, which they were. But less than two months after the opening of the Suez Canal, Emperor Franz Joseph of uh, the Austrian-Hungary, the Prussian Empire, and the uh, Napoleon III, or an Empress Eugenie, his wife of the French Empire, were at war with each other. And only 10 months after the, the opening of the Suez Canal, Emperor Napoleon III had to surrender, he was captured and had to surrender his army to the Prussians at the city of Sedan in France. And now this meant the end of the, uh, the Kingdom of France and brought up the Second Republic of France, which now, Eugenie and um, uh, her son, Louis Napoleon, and uh, Napoleon III had to flee to, to, uh, to England. And she stayed there after the death of her husband. She lived in exile in uh, England for 50 years. Young Louis Napoleon went on to have a career in the, in the British Army. Uh, it was said that Queen Victoria had big plans for him. Uh, she wanted, Queen Victoria wanted him to marry her youngest daughter, uh, Princess Beatrice, and he would, she would name him the King of France, and then maybe one day he would be able to go back to France and establish the Kingdom of France again. But that never happened because when he passed out of military college, he insisted on being sent to Africa to take part in the Zulu Wars so he could uh, attract a reputation for himself. Now, one day when he was on um, uh, a scouting mission, he exceeded his orders. He went much further than he was supposed to have gone. Uh, he and his men uh, camped. He was doing sketches of the local landscape. He didn't post any sentries, and they were attacked by 40 Zulu warriors, and uh, his horse bolted, and uh, Louis uh, Napoleon uh, fought, tried to fight off the Zulus, but he was killed. When his body was recovered the next day, they had 18 stab wounds in his body. And this was the end of the, the, the Bonaparte dynasty and the end of any hope of a new a kingdom of France. But Nigel is going to talk about Princess Eugenie at his talk this afternoon. So come along and hear more about that then. Now, when the, channel, when the canal was first opened in 1869, it was only 8 metres deep or 26 feet deep. At the bottom, it was only 22 metres wide. And at the surface, it was only a maximum of 91 metres. Uh, now, that included um, places where you could overtake. So every five or six miles, there was a, a cutting there where you could pull in and the ship coming the other way could, over, could come past and then before you could pull out and, uh, and go ahead again. So it was rather restricted. Now, Ferdinand de Lesseps, after he constructed the canal, he became known as the Grand France, uh, Francais, the, the great Frenchman. His reputation was he was the greatest Frenchman of all time, uh, or of his generation at least. 
At the age of 74, in 1879, he was made president of the Panama Canal Company. And his intention was to do exactly the same thing as what he'd done at Suez and put a canal across the Isthmus of Panama. Now, as he found out to his detriment, there's a lot of difference between building a canal on flat, sandy, uh, a place where there's virtually no rain uh, as opposed to a very muddy, a mountainous place where it almost never stops raining uh, in Panama. And uh, after a disastrous time which cost millions of dollars and tens of thousands of lives, mostly from uh, typhoid illness or, or malaria, many, many, many people died of malaria, the, the company failed and he had to sell the rights to build the Panama Canal to Teddy Roosevelt and the Americans which, which opened the canal 30 years after. Now this severely affected his reputation and he and Gustav Eiffel who had built the Eiffel Tower were both convicted of fraud and conspiracy during this time because they were accused or they were convicted of bribing French government officials to put more government money or public money into the construction of the Panama Canal but he's still very highly regarded in France. He had a lot to do with the Statue of Liberty as well I mean, he was the person who dedicated, who made, he was the official person, the Frenchman who dedicated the Statue of Liberty and gave it as a gift to the American people from the French people. But Lady Liberty uh, didn't start off, he wasn't always going to be in New York. Originally the plan was by the, uh, the d designer of the statue, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, his original plan was to that this would be placed at Port Said and it would be called the Egypt bringing light to Asia. But um, when he put the idea to the Lesseps and to the Egyptian government, they said, no, it's too expensive. It wasn't until the Lesseps was looking to raise money in America for the Panama Canal that he decided this was a great idea for New York Harbour and he, uh, allowed, he got the French government to, uh, to pay for it. And the original name was going to be Liberty Enlightening the World, but we since now know it as the Statue of Liberty or Lady Liberty. But he was the man that actually did the, the ceremony to hand it over to the people of America. But there was a statue to himself that was erected on the 17th of November, exactly 30 years after the original opening of ceremony of the canal. Unfortunately, he never got to see it. And this statue was at the entrance to the canal on the Mediterranean side at Port Said. His arm was extended, pointing to the entrance, pointing the way to the riches of Asia through the canal. Now this statue stayed there until uh, 1956 where it was torn down by General um, uh, uh, Nasser. But the, the, statue, the, the base of the statue is still there and over the last few years there's been a lot of talk about the fact that they should put the statue of Delessus up again because of the contribution that he made uh, to Egypt and to the Suez Canal. He died on December 7, 1894. Now, in the early operations, the early days of the Suez Canal, it wasn't all that good when it first started because I mean, in the year after it first opened there was only 486 transits through the canal which is less than two a day so there was nowhere near the receipts that they were expecting, nowhere near the return on investment that they were expecting and over the next 14 years there was actually 3,000 groundings a much more famous one will come across a, a, bit, uh, a bit later on but there was 3,000 groundings through the canal so improvements had to be done and these started in 1876 as more and more of the canal was dug out and as you'll see there are continuing to this day. Now in 1882 there was a nationalist uprising in Egypt. The, uh, the army rose and tried to overthrow the government and the British had to step in and they put down that nationalist uprising and they came in and they stayed and they took control over the entire uh, uh, country of Egypt and control of uh, the Suez Canal. And then the Convention of Constantinople, which took place in 1888. And this was a, 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 a meeting of all the major powers in Europe who were going to discuss how the, the, um, the, the canal was going to operate, 
how we were going to charge, uh, what, how are we going to charge? Was it going to be on tonnage or was it going to be on the value of the cargo? How exactly was that going to take place? Who was allowed to go through? And there was the kingdoms of United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Spain, France, Italy, the Netherlands, the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire. Now you can probably see from that there's one notable absence there. The country that the canal actually goes through. Egypt wasn't invited to this conference and they never got to sign the treaty and they still haven't to this day. But this treaty gave the rights of passage to all vessels, no matter what flag you flew, no matter what time it was. If you were in war with, these, with this vessel, it still had the right to tr uh, transit the Suez Canal as well as it was during peacetime. But that agreement didn't last all that long because it was only in 1904 that the British reneged and they wouldn't let the Russian Navy pass through the Suez Canal as they went to attack the, um, the Japanese during the, the Russo-Japanese War and they had to travel all the way around uh, Africa which gave the, the Japanese time to prepare. And they also reneged again during World War I and World War II. The Suez Canal was absolutely vital to the British during these wars, uh, especially World War II as, as General Rommel's Africa Corps swept across Africa and the, there was a danger that they would take the Suez Canal. If the Germans did, it was probably going to be the end of the war in their favour. So the British defended the canal with more than 100,000 troops and eventually fought Rommel off. And then the uh, Egyptians actually reneged on the agreement during the Six Day War in 1967, as we'll see, and the canal was blocked for eight years, or closed for eight years. The Suez Crisis of 1956. Now, the um, army generals of the Egyptian army, under the, uh, including General uh, Nasser, uh, took control. They overthrew the Kingdom of Egypt and they took control. Nasser became the president. Now he was seen first off as a, a supporter of the United States and they thought they could do business with him. He would be a great person to deal with who would negotiate peace between Israel and the Arab countries. But he saw himself as a more neutral party. He wanted to negotiate with the, the Russians as well as the Chinese and everyone else, as well as the Americans and the British. Now the Americans didn't like that. They thought that he was moving too close to the Soviet Union and they didn't like the fact that he gave he was one of the first people to give diplomatic relations to China and the Americans thought that perhaps he was going to encourage communism in the Middle East which is something that they didn't want. So they, the British and the Americans reneged on the, um, the, the promise that they would fund the construction of the Aswan High Dam project. That uh, angered uh, uh, NASA and he nationalised the Suez Canal. Now this was in uh, 1956. The canal was was supposed to be uh, under the command of the control of the Suez Canal Company for 99 years. So he nationalised it uh, 23 years earlier than it should have been. Now the Aswan Dam was finally financed by the, by the Soviet Union, and this is a, a photo of uh, General Nasser and President Khrushchev opening, doing the official opening of the Aswan Dam. Uh, Khrushchev said that the Aswan Dam was the eighth wonder of the world. It's one of the largest dams anywhere in the world and even today it supplies 70% of the, all the power all the way across Egypt. Now in, on October 29th of that year, Israel decided to invade Sinai, uh, the, the Egyptian Sinai. The Egyptian forces went to confront the uh, Israelis. Now. The uh, British and the French took advantage of this and they landed paratroopers along the Suez Canal saying that they were going to control the Suez Canal to keep the, the sea lanes open for world trade. Now, it was pretty obvious to everyone that they'd been in collusion with the Israelis and this invasion had been planned for quite some time. So that angered the, uh, the Egyptians and they sunk 40 ships in the canal, closing the canal so no one could use it. So while the British and the Israelis and the French actually achieved most of their military objectives, the main aim of keeping the canal open, they'd failed at. So 
The rest of the world were very angry by this. They wanted the British and everyone to withdraw so the canal could open again. And President Eisenhower threatened the British. Uh, they, he said that they would sell all of the US government's bonds, the sterling bonds, which would decimate the British economy uh, and force it into bankruptcy. So eventually the British had to withdraw uh, and French had to withdraw from the Suez Canal. And that, um, that, uh, that back down, that capitula capitulation by the British uh, meant that was the end of their role as one of the world's great powers. Had a lot of other consequences as well because the British Prime Minister Anthony Eden had to resign in disgrace. Uh, a Canadian Minister for State uh, Affairs, Lester Pearson, won the Nobel Peace Prize because of his suggestion that the UN send a peacekeeping force to control the Suez Canal, which is something that had never been done before. This is the very first UN peacekeeping mission and the MFO, the Multinational Force and Observers, is still in operation along the Suez Canal today. But this also meant that the Russians the Soviets felt very emboldened to send their own troops into Hungary to um, smash the rebellion that was happening there at the time. Um, the, the British and the French really couldn't be say, well, you should get out of there when they'd just gone into, uh, into the, uh, Egypt. So this emboldened the Russians and they were able to crush the, the, uh, the revolution and uh, uh, communism continued in, uh, in Hungary at that time. So a lot of consequences all around the world. During the Six-Day War in 1967, where Israel and Egypt were at war with each other, the Egyptians decided to close the Suez Canal again. They sunk some ships at one end and they, they uh, dropped in mines uh, at the other end, so it was closed. There was 15 ships that were trapped in the canal at that time that couldn't go any further. And this became known as the Yellow Fleet because of all the yellow dust and, and sand that covered the ships from, um, we'll get back in a second, that covered these, these ships. So it became known as, as the Yellow Fleet. And they were stuck in the canal for eight years that it was closed. Now, the crew did get some respite. They were able to, um, um, to go a, to uh, swap with each other uh, for a th over a three-month period. They had to keep the same crews, but those crews rotated over a three-month period. And they had their own sporting teams and they played games against each other. It was like mini Olympics all the time. They even created their own um, stamps. And this became known as the Great Bitter Lakes, uh, Bitter Lakes Association Stamps. And these became famous around the world. They became a collector items and very, very expensive stamps, if you can get some of them. Now, oil. Now, in 1955, Western Europe imported 2 million barrels per day from, of oil from the Middle East, which made up two-thirds of their energy needs at that time. In 2021, that had risen to 10.6 million barrels per day. And even today, the US imports 300,000 barrels of oil per day from the Middle East, and it all comes through the Suez Canal. In 2021, 20,600 ships went through, which was 56, an average of 56 vessels per day. The canal can handle bigger uh, traffic and uh, uh, more traffic than the Panama Canal takes between 11 and 16 hours to transit the Suez Canal at an average speed of 11 knots. And there's $3 billion worth of cargo goes through the Suez Canal every single day. In 2008, there was a record amount of 21,415 vessels passed through the canal with receipts or income totaling $5.381 billion. So that works out to an average of just over a quarter, quarter of a million US dollars per ship going through the canal, which I think you'll agree is a lot of money. And then in March 2021, we had the ever given disaster. The, um, it uh, became wedged after a, uh, in the Suez Canal after it was hit by uh, some winds. The pilot said it was hit by winds. And it, it was stuck for six days in the canal, which caused a massive pileup of 450 ships that, that had to wait for it to be uh, blocked. 
Now, could you imagine if we were sailing up to the Suez Canal right now, it was a ship became lodged in the canal, we couldn't get through, we had a choice, we could either wait or we could go all the way around Africa. I think there'd be a pretty big lineup at guest services, don't you? Yeah, well that's what exactly what happened because there was at least eight cruise ships that had to wait there that couldn't get through. And they had a lot of them had to go all the way around to get to, to make it uh, back home again. 12% of all global trade passes through the Suez Canal. 30% of all global container traffic passes through 52 ships a day. And there's the Ever Given there. It's about the same uh, length as the Empire State Building is high, which is absolutely incredible. And we, the ship passed today that was 20% bigger than the Ever Given. So massive, massive ships. If you were, had ordered something on uh, Amazon or something like that, or you were waiting for a package anywhere in the world, it was probably held up by the, uh, this one disaster, this one ship being stuck in the Suez Canal. It caused massive problems all around and backups all around the world. Absolutely incredible. Now in 2014, the president of Egypt decided that they wanted a bigger canal. He decided to create a bypass, a Bala bypass, which is 35 kilometres down the right-hand side there, uh, all the way through. And this now means that uh, sh ships can transit the Suez Canal in both directions simultaneously, making it much more efficient. Now this costs $9 billion, but because work was carried out 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was completed in only one year and it reopened again on uh, this route reopened on the 6th of August 2015. Port Said at the uh, Mediterranean side of the Suez Canal, which will pass through uh, tomorrow, uh, it was created because of the Suez Canal. But today, 770,000 people call this home. A another great thing for the, from the Suez Canal. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of the Suez, Suez Canal and the passage between the seas. I hope you've have learned something. I hope you enjoyed the transit tomorrow. It's going to be great fun. I'll be back in a few days' time and I'll be talking to you about the King of the Pirates, uh, Barbarossa. I hope to see you then. <laughs>